Rachel Horning, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Martin. So let's start out. Tell us about your, your everything for me is a superhero metaphor. So tell us about your, you know, we're going to get into your secret identity later, but you know, tell us about <laughs> how, how you got the superhero powers, what you do, what you're all about, and you know, but the particulars about why you're awesome. Oh, let's start from my founding. I'm a very passionate Angelino, born and raised um, in sunny Los Angeles from a very young age. And I promise there's a reason why I'm starting at the age of like two. No, no, I we, was, we, can, we can edit all this out. It's no problem. Hope I, have. I was instilled from a very young age. Oh, can you see me now? I can see you now. You disappeared. Okay. Quickly. Oh no. Well, back, hopefully, hopefully the Wi-Fi is going to be decent for this. I'll start fresh. Thank you for asking, Martin. I'll start by telling you a little bit about my pretty young upbringing, because I think that there's actually a very direct through line to what I do today and why I do what I do. As a fellow member of the Jewish tribe, I'm sure you're well aware of the term tikkun olam, heal the world. And starting at a really young age, my parents instilled what felt like a fiduciary responsibility to leave the world in a better place than how I found it. And I took that with me into everything I've basically ever done. So, you know, fifth grade, I was class president because I felt like we needed someone with a really like sort of optimistic charm to, to take the helm of my fifth grade class. And then, you know, got really politically involved when I was um, a student at UC Berkeley. And then from there, moved back home to Los Angeles, where I began a career, kind of an unintentional career in politics, and found myself getting roles either as public policy manager of X or comms, uh, communications director of Y. And I'm not exactly sure how or why that uh, became my sort of secret sauce, but I have about an eight-year uh, history in the LA political nonprofit and most recently agency arena um, where I've worked well, spoiler with... Spoiler alert, the reason you did that is because you're really good at it. Fair. I didn't know I was... I didn't study that. I had, I had no sort of, you know, no way of knowing that that was going to be my, my secret sauce, but somehow it found me. It's actually funny, when I first got out of college, I was hired to be, I think the title was a, a membership coordinator um, at a local chamber of commerce. And I left that job as the communications director and then got hired to be a public policy manager at the next nonprofit that I worked in, left as a communications director. And I worked at a strategic communications agency for the last uh, three years, most recently. So... That's definitely uh, my skill set by day. I've also had a side hustle for quite a while that started a little over six years ago now. Basically, when I uh, graduated from college, I left what felt like a really modern kind of hip campus, uh, moved back to my hometown, ended up at a chamber of commerce, felt a little bit like I had taken a step back in the decades and was no longer surrounded by cutting edge technology and I wasn't surrounded by kind of like a startup bubble. And I decided I was gonna take it upon myself to create that vibe at my place of work. And some people would call that intrapreneurship. So I basically on somebody else's dime got to experiment with some ideas and in doing so ended up creating a co-working space out of the Chamber of Commerce boardroom because it was sitting idle by the day and we decided why not open this up to the community so that they can actually use it get to know one another it was kind of like supercharging the benefits of chamber membership that were already available to you and just doing so with more of like a modern flair and so the co-working model is still in existence today at that chamber of commerce which is really cool and then in addition to that I launched a technology initiative where we were able to combine the business owners in the, the Silicon Beach, West Los Angeles area 
the more like traditional business owners with the burgeoning startup community. And I was able to do that by reaching out to a lot of different media, organizing the tech community in Venice and Santa Monica, but also El Segundo, Playa Vista. At the time, Playa Vista was still under construction. YouTube Space LA was just moving in. There was just such a kind of fresh energy. And I was able to tap into that, created a whole new sort of united front with the traditional business owners getting to know a lot of the, the startup founders and entrepreneurs that were moving in. And it was a really special moment, I think, in kind of like the West Side's founding story of Silicon Beach. And that's actually how I went on to meet my now business partner, Zach, because he was one of those meetup organizers that was already amassing this really cool community of generally speaking, young, you know, hip tech nerds. <laughs> and we started throwing parties together because the Chamber of Commerce members were a lot of like the hotels and the apartment owners. And they were very eager to get the foot traffic of the startup community through their doors. Zach, among a few other organizers, had the people that they were looking for. So we uh, started working together and had a lot of success. And in doing so, developed our own brand. A couple years into that, we finally um, got ourselves an LLC and became legit. This was back in like 2013, 2014. Here we are, it's 2020. Now it's my full-time job. So it's pretty cool. You can kind of hear your superpower, which is community building. But I'm, you know, a lot of people talk about community building and it doesn't ring true. For me, I, I don't mean like a, the term community builder, even though I know you come from the political space, I don't really hear it as political. It's almost like you have the party ethos, but you bring it to business. And mm. um, like what I mean by party, so the, there's good parties and there's bad parties and we've all been to bad parties and there's nothing worse, right? You just right. You get dressed up and the music's just wrong and the conversations are perfunctory and it's like, are you looking at your watch? How much longer do I have to stay here? And do I gotta kind of gnaw off my hand to leave it in the trap and get out of the party? Whereas a yeah. good one is like, there's some, there's a good ratio of new people to people you know, and the conversation is lively and the food is good, but not overwhelming and everything's just so. And every time you organize an event, it has that vibe, although it's not necessarily a social party. It's sometimes it's a get to know business mixer or it's a fundraiser for something. And, and the superpower from my perspective, one of them is that if you've got enough of the mentality, what makes a good host, but also about like what makes an event interesting. So has mm -hmm. that always been natural to you or some of that learned? I think it's a combination. I was really lucky to grow up in a community that fostered leadership in its young people. I had a bat mitzvah when I was 12 years old and I had a congregation of 300 people watching me lead them in prayer and it was horrifying. And I think that that was one of many opportunities that I was gifted with as a young person um, where I was really forced to step into my leadership prowess. And I guess that's when I was able to begin flexing my, my muscles in really taking the discomfort head on and kind of getting a little addicted to the feeling of getting nervous about coalescing groups where I knew I wasn't going to be totally in control of outcomes and sort of divorcing myself from any expectation around said outcomes was probably like the hardest part of that journey. And I'm still on that path. But yeah, I think to a certain extent, I think I was born with the gift of sort of deepening human connection. I don't know how or why I'm definitely an empath. I can feel energy in a room in ways that others probably can't. I think we're all experiencing space and time in such different ways. But yeah, I, I love nothing more than talking to someone about a challenge that they're facing in building community and just sort of like iterating on ideas with them. It's just how I think. I like to tell people that I think in terms of human connection. It's what makes me light up when I get to talk about it. Moreover, it's obviously what So feeling a sense of alignment with self and purpose when I'm in a room either moderating a panel or if I'm the producer of the event with 800 people or 200 people, I, I feel 
a light inside of me turn on that literally no other activity that I can possibly imagine doing like is able to have that effect. So I think it's a, a nice combination of nature and nurture, if that answers your question. Yeah. And as with anything, with practice, I've just gotten better and better and better. I'm a fan of the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours theory that once you put in the work, you're able to see the things that you didn't even know you needed to be looking for. And I think I still have quite a bit of work to do on my my journey of really discovering like how to manifest my superpower, but that's certainly what I identify and how I identify like myself within this world um, is a human connector. The way I can tell that that is the case for you is when I see you producing an event with two, 300 people and I come over to say hi, you talk to me in a relaxed way like, oh yeah, you're at this party too. Oh yeah, how's it going? For sure. Going, right? And you're just having fun. Yeah. And so you're able to multitask. You already have enough of it under control that you can enjoy the, enjoy the experience itself. Mm-hmm. So, oh, I, that see was your, it. I see your vice president is uh, your cat is, is, is jumping in the picture. So. <laughs> Welcome to quarantine 2020. We're all, we're all meeting each other's we pets. We love it. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. You know, one quick note on that, Martin, I had somebody give me what they referred to as critical feedback. They went to one of my events. This was one of our startups in the sky events in downtown LA and some big tower. You know, we probably had two or 300 people that night. And I think I had had a volunteer back out at the last minute, which unfortunately happens somewhat regularly when we're actually dealing with traffic and things like that. And so I took over. I was checking people in at my own event. And obviously that took me away from managing vendors and and some of the other like areas of the event that really needed tending to. I didn't think anybody would notice. I was looking at the silver lining. Oh, I get to connect with everyone as they enter the event. I'll get their name um, and just welcome them in a way that will hopefully leave them, leave them feeling seen, leave them feeling heard, leave them feeling like they're special. But afterward, it was a, a really close friend of mine actually that said for future reference, if you want to look like a well-oiled machine, I would advise you to not work check-in at your own event. If you can divide and conquer, that's really what you should be doing. You needed to be out there networking with other sponsors. You needed to be out there talking to your speakers, making sure that they felt you know, prepared. And I just, I was really grateful for that feedback, took it to heart, absolutely. And I just, it was such a big wake up call for me that people are watching people are watching your every move when you're in the event world when you're in any business of course everybody's watching everyone that was a a big sort of like sort of paradigm shift for me like okay level up Rachel it's time to put your big girl pants on and make sure that you've got all of these different seats filled because you as a single person cannot make this whole thing happen you need to delegate and I yeah so anyway that's a, a learning of mine tell us about startup coil so yeah, after eight years of having the, the day job and the night job, the night job became the full-time job. I left my consulting role on February 7th, 2020 to run Startup oh, Coil, which- so long ago. Hmm. <laughs> it's been a roller coaster. Feels like um, 10 years, but yeah. It feels like 10 years. Isn't that so nutty? Yeah. It's like- Oh, in the old days when we could actually get in our car and visit our friends and give them hugs. Uh, Yeah, so I decided after more contemplation that I would like to admit that it was time for me to step into yet again the discomfort of the unknown. And I decided that I was going to take over the Startup Coil Network as CEO. The founder of Startup Coil was my co-founder of Startups in the Sky. And Startups in the Sky was the big community back in my Chamber of Commerce days. And that's how I met Zach. Zach founded Startup Coil. Sorry if that was a little roundabout. But anyway, after running Startup Coil for eight years, Zach actually wanted to step away and go run his new CBD startup. So the timing was really perfect. And, or so I thought, (laughs) and I stepped away from my very cushy consulting job to run the Startup Coil Network. And you asked, what is Startup Coil? 
it is a startup in and of itself that manages a lot of our own original event content. So we do our own event production. We also supercharge other people's event content through a pretty extensive online email list. We also have collectively about 25,000 members of the network because of the meetups that we run as well. We're able to pay our bills because sponsors sponsor us and we uh, generally are able to charge um, our attendees a, a couple of bucks to come to the happy hours in some cases or some of the educational events um, in other cases. As you might imagine, um, four weeks into my CEO role, my, my, my first move as CEO was actually shuttering all of our events because of coronavirus. Very precarious timing to have just stepped away from a comfortable day job. <laughs> Every single means of making money through Startup Coil was shuttered overnight. And so, you know, right now you're looking at someone who is amidst pivoting an entire business model and really trying day in and day out to throw new ideas out there, see what sticks. We don't know what we're doing most of the time. I think a lot of us are sort of in this like experimental mode right now as we go virtual. We had a successful happy hour. We're going to continue playing with some of the, the learnings from that. We're launching a podcast. But your, yeah. mis your misfortune is, you know, perfect for us because this is the theme of our podcast. I know. You know what is my Corona experience? Oh my God, <laughs> you've got to pivot your own business. The, the good news is you get to be the perfect guest on this podcast. Oh, so, what a gift to Martin. Thank what you. A gift. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so, so you had, yeah. so you, you started pivoting to, to, to virtual. So you had a uh, virtual happy hour, which was extremely successful. So tell us about that. Yeah, I'm actually going to like write a blog post because I want to share what we did and what we learned that was actually super successful in making people feel like they were part of a community and like they were actually stepping outside of the four walls of their home. This was the formula. Take notes, people. First of all, we got a really great group of Startup Coil community members to RSVP to our online event. I think we gave them like a two week runway to RSVP. So the timing was clear as day ahead of time. We were able to then amass about a hundred people that ended up joining our happy hour, our first virtual happy hour. Um, we were able to dangle some bait in front of them by offering a quick um, double set of lightning chat. So we had um, the CEO of Hawk Media, Eric Huberman. Um, he was able to come on for the first 15 minutes, talked about what's working, what isn't working for startups during the COVID era, because he services like 400 different startup clients at Hawk Media. From there, we pivoted over to Matthew Techley from LA City Council member Mike Bonin's office. He was able to give sort of the local Los Angeles perspective on what sort of loans are available to startups and then um, also what the startup community can be doing to give back right now. So we offered sort of this educational asset in the beginning and then for the, that was the first half an hour, for the next hour, we broke people out into Zoom breakout rooms at random. So again, we had about 100 people. We broke people out into rooms of about six. And for each breakout session, so it was 15 minutes each with six people in each room, we had me, me as the moderator telling everybody what the question was that they were going to be responding to for the next 15 minutes. And the questions um, were handpicked because of their sort of get to know you nature. Everything was aimed at really deepening human connection, which as you might imagine, can be sort of difficult through an online format. But what we, what we learned is that it's actually not that difficult. And people in some cases said that they actually preferred this model because there was no background noise. They were able to connect on a deeper level with more people than they would have had they just been sort of randomly standing around at a happy hour event. Anyway, we had four different questions for four different breakout sessions, six people each. 
between each transition, we kicked people out of their breakout room, brought them back into the main room, where I then delivered the next question. And then every time you were with new people. And so by the end of it, you had spoken to five times four, 20 people. And the way that we were received was in such like positive regard that we're A, going to do this again. B, we're going to start doing this on a like more decentralized kind of format. So we're actually going to start connecting with sister cities and inviting people from different parts of the world to come talk to the LA startup community. Because why not? Am I allowed to cuss? Yeah. Because why the hell not? (laughs) So we're looking at this as an opportunity to really lean into this kind of borderless place that we're in. We dropped the LA from the title LA Tech Happy Hour. It's now called Tech Happy Hour. Mind blown. Mind blown. I was out there. This is going to sound really basic, but it is what it is. Amidst a yoga practice, I had this really beautiful moment with myself uh, where I think I just needed to drop the whole victim mentality. Like, woe is me. I just quit my job. I have no income. Holy shit. I just took on this new role as the CEO of an event startup four weeks before coronavirus hit, everything I thought I was going to be able to monetize, I can't. Holy shit. And I, I transferred the angst into a moment of realization, which was, oh, we'll edit this out, Martin. Sorry. I don't know. We don't have to. It's real life now. That's what It's real life, doing. y'all. <laughs> So the the realization and the revelation that I had, this sort of like paradigm shift, was that all of my least favorite elements from event production are no longer even available to me, even if I wanted them. So I'm not having to pay venues and RIP venues. That's a whole different conversation. I have a lot of friends in that space too that are actually really hurting right now. We're not able to hire staff. We're not able to spend money on the things that some your would alcohol, say are your alcohol bills probably lower yeah exactly now it's now it's byob exactly like yeah. oh you want to bring you know you want to bring uh some booze to happy hour bring it yourself yeah so i think i realized that my secret sauce is the human connection like thing and i can continue delivering that and if anything i can just deliver it with fewer distractions now and so that's kind of, that's where I'm at. I, I sort of had to transfer the, the anxiety and sort of the woe is me mentality into, you know what, this could be a huge kind of asset if I choose to see it that way. And of course, that doesn't even capture kind of the nuance of the moment we're in, because I'm certainly not celebrating this moment by any means. I think that it's obviously hugely devastating and quite scary and very sad. But do I want to sit around moping around all day? No, I don't. I want to continue sharpening my tools and just making the best that I can out of a very sort of unprecedented moment for at least someone my age to really just lean in, stay creative. I I know that you you don't know what, you know, how old old people are, but I wasn't around for the black peg either. It's new for me too. Was that 1918? (laughs) Uh, you no, know, I you know that was twelve hundred, I think. You know, Spanish flu is like nothing, <laughs> right? Spanish flu. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. It's uh, it's it's what we're all dealing with. That's the thing, right? So, have you thought about okay, how are you going to monetize it? Um. Yes, I, I would say that we're just in a really experimental phase right now. I like to say that we're throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Right. I don't, I don't, I would be lying to you if I said that we have kind of like the, the formula figured out. I have a feeling that the networking happy hour model that we're kind of simmering in and working on will probably be the easiest thing to monetize because I know that people are hungry to actually meet new people right now and don't really have many avenues to do that. At the same time, I'm going to be building my own podcast all about 
uh, ethics and the internet. And obviously it takes a while to build an audience for a podcast. It's a little meta saying this on another podcast. <laughs> um, but I, I envision being able to bring sponsors on for that. And then of course we have kind of like our built-in sponsorship pipeline already kind of baking within the Startup Coil network. Folks that still want to be out there in front of the community, whether it's getting featured on the emails that we're sending out or being actual event partners with us, but in the virtual space. We can like shout them out when we're opening up our happy hour and, and just thank our sponsors for continuing to support us and support the community. And so I don't think that's going anywhere. It's just a different ask. We had to we had to update the entire sponsorship uh, deck that we would ordinarily send out, giving sponsors access to an exhibitor booth at all of the events for six months that Startup Coil is putting on. We can't do that anymore. And so it's all just a matter of asking ourselves, like, what is the virtual version of this? And it just, yeah, we've just continued asking ourselves, like, what is the equivalent of that online? And sometimes it's not apples to apples. And so we just have to stay, again, super creative, open-minded, not beat ourselves up. There's going to be a lot of failure. There already has been plenty of failure um, in this kind of experimental phase. But I'm also really optimistic that once it's all said and done, we will have learned a lot. I think we'll, we will have expanded our network. And most importantly, we will have provided a service to the community to ensure that they continue to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And I think when you're locked up in your house all day, the isolation gets real. And the more that we can offer connectedness and a sense of community, the better. And that's the feedback we got from that first virtual happy hour, which is why I want to share that kind of like model out to the world. So I'm going to, again, write a little blog post to share that. And I would be happy to send it to you. Once Beautiful. it's done. Awesome. Yeah. So I think one of the things we're all learning, but what I'm hearing what you're saying is that we kind of attached the, where we're, we're, we're providing the value to, we made a shortcut. So you might think like the physical space is what you were providing, or you might think the food, the drink, the whatever it is, you think that that's, that's what they're paying for because that was what's, what's an easy thing to collect the money for. Right. But really what they're, paying you for is the connection, the knowledge, the connection, the ability to move forward. When you go to an event, the, the events I've been, been at with you, what's invaluable is hearing ideas that you never heard. Oh my God, they have a company that does X, Y, and Z. Oh, I never thought of that before. I wonder what that is. Oh, right. wow. These guys are doing that. Maybe I can use that. Oh, this, these guys could be great customers. Oh, these guys could be great vendors and might be around your chicken dinner that you're, that's what mm -hmm. you're paying for or you're paying for drinks or you're paying, but that was never what you were paying for. And it's not what you're paying for virtually. And, and what you're working out is how to communicate that value to your customers and mm -hmm. how to rearrange it. So you can still be profitable or you can, you can make money and you're still providing the value. And that's what I'm interested in. It's like how you're doing that. It's really cool. I think what you're calling out is a really beautiful metaphor for kind of the reckoning that we're seeing all over the world. I think a lot of folks were camouflaging their hunger for whether it was adrenaline or just escapism by traveling, or there's so many kind of parallels to what you're describing with just all of the accoutrement with events that now, even aside from events, we're realizing once you really pare down your life and you get down to the basics of who you are, what you stand for, what you enjoy doing, I think so many people had forgotten who they were. And in a way, this is a really beautiful moment of kind of like forced connection to self. And of course, I'm coming from a really privileged place to be, be able to say that because I'm not in fear for my safety and in this moment, obviously it's not, it's not spread out as equally as I wish it was. But for a lot of people, I think there's this kind, kind of coming back to self. And in the same way in the event world, it is really this kind of coming like back to the basics. What do people want at events? They don't necessarily want the food and beverage. They don't necessarily want 
the views. What they're looking for is either a productive conversation that moves the needle for their business or some type of paradigm shifting revelation or there's, or like a feeling of connectedness. And I think all of those things are available to you in a Zoom happy hour. And so that's what we're really, to your point, that's, that's really what we're trying to distill right now. The jury's out. I don't know what that is going to look like in sort of like a, a large scale formula, but we're going to figure it out. And that's kind of the journey that we're on right now. It's scary and enlightening and exciting and weird. So that's, yeah. that's where we're at. <laughs> well, the fun part of what we're experiencing, like I went through a period where I, I watched all these old movies and I went through my Cary Grant phase. I must have seen 15 different Cary Grant. I, I highly recommend the Thin Man series. Uh, yeah, just these are black and white movies. And uh, you know, earlier and earlier, I went and saw some Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton movies, and they're hilarious. But what's so interesting, the older that you go to the movies, there are all these conventions that were invented along the way, and then they were destroyed along the way. M my brother and I just loved TV in the 70s and 80s, and the particularly shows we love. But there's some conventions with now I think about it, they're kind of crazy. But if you look at an action action series, let's say the Six Million Dollar Man, or you look at mm -hmm. the A Team, or you look at a lot of these, there's a convention where you have a fight, boom, 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 you hit each other, you punch somebody and you knock them out, and they are unconscious. And so this is a constant thing. Oh, you beat them up, you don't kill them, because nobody kills each other on TV back in the 70s or the 80s. And but you punch them and then they're down. And that's just sort of like a convention according to the writers. Yeah, it's okay. They're not dead, but they're no longer a problem. And it was just sort of like, yeah, we do that. And that's okay. And now what we, what we know about concussions is if you knock somebody out like that, like it'll happen mm -hmm. in a boxing match, you're causing them permanent damage, right? And you think about what a concussion is. If you ever, you ever have fought somebody in real life, you very rarely, there's a very thin line. You can knock people out, but often you'll kill them. You, you, you don't typically, in a fight, punch people out and then you're, you knock them out cold. But for some reason, we all believed that and that was a thing and it was like a convention. You look back to, like one of the things that's brilliant about, about the great movie makers and you, you think about Hitchcock. He invented certain shots that we all use now. So like you cut from one thing to another or you have a, a particular eye view of things. You look at the movies before that, they just didn't have that. They didn't tell stories that way. When you talk about how you had the LA in front of in, in front of your event, LA Tech, and then you go from tech from LA Tech to just tech, it's it's kind of like I had I was on a Zoom call yesterday with a friend of mine that I've been friends with since literally kindergarten, and we don't spend that much time together anymore. We rarely, but we just caught up by Zoom, and it's really no difference in the conversation. You're in LA, I'm in LA, he's in Toronto what's the difference from bandwidth perspective? You know, so he was telling me about a call and we had some other friends that people I went to high school with or elementary school with, and I'm getting on a call with these guys later this week. And it's like, well, why wouldn't I? What, but why wouldn't I? There was, I, I had this technology 10 years ago. Why didn't I 10 years ago? Right. And I think this prolonged, this prolonged being in this space is going to change some of our habits. I hope, hope for good mm -hmm. where we really realize there's no reason the people we were close with they're friends of mine that i really dearly love they're in london and i haven't talked to them in years why mm -hmm. not so you know like i'm that's the part of stuff where i'm like it's it seems so stupid but calling yourself the like when i'm thinking of different business initiatives or whatever the la blah 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 or the long beach blah 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 but you know i'm, I'm i go outside for 30 minutes a day I, I spend as much time with you as I do, you know, with right now as, as I would with somebody who's in New York or in, in right. London. So uh, let's get smarter about that. Let's take advantage of this connected world. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is maybe one of the unintended consequences of this moment we're in with COVID, but I feel more deeply connected to almost all of my friends right now because of the fact that we can't see each other. And it really does kind of in the same way that I was talking about going back to basics with how you curate an event experience or just how people are sort of forced into this more isolated place where they're reckoning with themselves. 
I think friendships are another example of having fewer distractions. You're not going out meeting for drinks and maybe talking to a stranger for half an hour. You're FaceTiming and you're looking at each other with no other distractions. Now it's just the two of you. And it really, I think, enables much deeper connection than any of us could have dreamt possible. And that's really freaking cool. Time will tell if that's going to really stick once we're able to sort of go back to normal. I don't even know what normal is going to be. It's going to be a new normal. Right. Uh, well, but how, much, I, how much Netflix or how much streaming are you doing? Hardly any. I'm just working. Yeah, me neither. And it's, yeah. and it's more fun. On the weekend, I'll make a point to watch a movie with my girlfriend. And we'll just because otherwise you could just work 24-7. Yeah. And so she's really busy. I'm really busy. The funny thing is like with all this technology, when we both film at the same time, it's like, we just got to stay out of each other's way. It's pretty funny. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 I'm finding I'm, I'm, I'm doing it on purpose rather than just, Oh, home for a long day. Just veg out, turn on the, turn on the, the, the streaming machine. But yeah. I would have thought I'd be streaming all the time, but actually no. I'm right there with you, Martin. I, God, I started watching Tiger King and I couldn't get into it, which I know in many circles, those are fighting words there, but couldn't get into it. And then I think I gave up on TV. I, I just I, also, I didn't, I didn't yeah. even bother to put it in my, I, I just, yeah. I, I get it. It's this great cultural moment, but I guess I'm just going to miss this one. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be ready for the next one, but we're, we're fighting hard through this one. So. <laughs> So what, yeah. what else have you learned about yourself that you didn't know six weeks ago? I think more than ever, what I'm learning, and, and it's what I'm learning now, given this moment we're in, but I think it's also what I was hoping to see in myself when I let go of the comforts of a day job mm -hmm. is really seeing my creative side coming out. I think I've always wanted her to be this dynamic fluid part of my own kind of personal expression. I've never worked in a place where that was fully understood or fully appreciated or harnessed. And I never felt like I could freely express my most creative self. And now nothing is holding me back. And I'm having these really incredible conversations with people in my life that just turn into these really cool kind of iterative, creative connecting dialogues. And I just, I feel like I'm swimming in creativity. I'm swimming in innovation right now. And in a way I can sort of thank the moment we're in for forcing that. I mean, the rug was pulled out from under all of us. For me, it felt like a very precarious moment because I just quit my job and was taking on this role of an event company, <laughs> but in a, in a beautiful way, I think it's really forcing like very existential questioning for me in terms of like who I am and how I want to show up for my community when my community needs community more than ever before. And what a gift to be able to experiment with that question at its most basic level right now when it's it's become such a basic need for so many people. I, I guess to to directly answer your question, what have I learned? I've learned that I'm still able to maintain creativity and thrive in my creativity um, in a crisis, and that's really freaking cool. And I have my my good moments. I will be honest and say that I've shed many a tear too. I think it's a scary time to have financial insecurity. It's a scary time to experience job loss, to have to, not in my, my own experience, but there's people that are working full-time jobs and now full, are full-time teachers to their young ones. I, there's just, there's so much happening. <laughs> Everyone's experience is a little different, obviously. And it, I think mine is really truly characterized by choosing to step up to the plate and maintain my composure most of the time. Which turns out to be a superpower. Evidently. Yeah. I think we've talked about my framework around winning the day, that the way that you really move forward is not, you, you, you're not going to, you're not going to have your company be successful in one day. 
you got to incrementally yeah. just using the football. We, we guys, we love our sports metaphors, right? Is, uh, is that we just move the ball forward and, and, and we have their wins a little bit at a time. So what, what, is, what, is, what does winning the day or winning the week look like for you? How do you organize yourself so that you, you can be successful when you're, you're running an event or anything that you're doing? Yeah, I have um, this because I, for anyone listening, you're not going to fully appreciate this, but I actually, I'm old school. I have a composition what is, book. Is that, is that an app? What are we looking at? <laughs> this is a composition book, y'all. Do you download Circa, that like, from the, which, which, which store do you download that from? <laughs> Definitely not the app store. A lot of really sloppy notes. Okay. Every time I'm on a call, I've got a pen in my hand. In my my previous work life, the expectation was that we were always going to type our notes. And that was just like the company culture. That was the expectation of my, my teammates and everyone at the company. Personally, if I'm not handwriting it, I'm not truly connecting with it. So this has been a really fun way of winning the day for me, setting goals out on my composition book and then using it concurrently to take notes when I'm on calls. So many people have gifted me with big ideas and things like that that I'm able to just write down. And then ending the day by writing at least three things down that I achieved. So maybe that's like expressing gratitude for X or saying I was able to actually um, respond to those five emails that I have been meaning to respond to for the last week. Yay. It's like the small victories, the big victories, kind of a, a little bit of everything goes into my book here. And to be honest, I think I'm still trying to figure out what my winning formula looks like for winning the day because something about COVID has really unsettled my routine. And yeah, so it's the to-do list, it's the note-taking, it's the inventory at the end of the day. And then actually my good friend Martin <laughs> had me go through an exercise recently all around context, purpose, and results that I have found to be a really helpful tool as well in grounding me for just the next 30 days. And so it's not as like immediate in the approach. It's more of like a 30 day <clears throat> commitment to self and in my case to community. So that's been really neat too. No, that's awesome. So all I've got. <laughs> it's awesome. No, I, I hear the organization and what you're doing and uh, I, I don't use the composition book. I like, you know, this guy, but there's something visceral about writing things down and uh, I've got all the technological doodads. Yes. Well, so, so the reason I use this, it's a Parker pen and it's a little upgraded, but it's not, it's not that expensive. My dad used those, those pens. So it's funny. Once, once our loved ones leave the little things that it's like, every time I look at that pen, I think of my dad. So yeah. Yeah. That's cool. really special. Yeah. Yeah. I think of fourth grade when I look at my composition book. <laughs> It's probably identical to the composition books that we were using way back when. Maybe it's helping me tap into like my inner child. Yeah, well, it's all good. I mean, like there's re sometimes we don't know why we're effective and then we deconstruct it and we realize like you, you've always been good at the stuff that you do, but maybe you don't realize that taking the notes that you do and taking them the way that you do is a process you've come up with that's effective for you. And so right. distinguishing what about that is effective and what about that uh, applies to your, to, to how you're doing something differently. I'm the, the, a lot of the things that made me successful 20 years ago, I still use, but then there's yeah. other new things that I adapt and I'm kind of a tools junkie. So I'll, I'll use new pieces. When, when I first started being really effective, I used the day runner and I had a particular way. And then some of the habits I had way back then, do you know what a day runner is? Imagine a calendar but you've got like a three ring binder and you can add new mm -hmm. pieces of paper. And so if you've got a project mm. and then when you're done with the project, you can pull it out and file it somewhere. Got else. it. Yeah. Um, I feel My so dad actually had a day timer is what he called it. I think he still uses it to this day. A day timer. Competing brand. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 
he loves his day timer. And I'm just like, yo, when are you going to just start tracking your stuff on like Trello or something, some workflow tool, but I don't think. Well, no, you're, you're the same age as my children. So uh, yeah, (laughs) I can identify with your dad. Fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) Your dad sounds like a very smart man. Ah. (laughs) Yeah, he is. He's a cool guy. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So what is it you'd like to leave our audience with? I think given the topic at hand, this is sort of my COVID experience in a nutshell is looking for the beauty in the darkness. Everybody's going to have a different COVID experience. People are losing loved ones. People are losing their lives. It is serious, it is sad and devastating on so many levels. And I don't want to diminish any of that by saying to find the beauty in the darkness at all. However, for the majority of us that are going to continue with our daily lives, I think it's really important to remember that it's up to us to choose how we receive this current moment that we're in. No one is going to hand you hope on a silver platter you have to cultivate that hope yourself. And you do that by surrounding yourself with optimists. And you do that by surrounding yourself with other doers. And you do that by creating the reality that you wish to exist within. And I think for me, it's been so important to maintain those relationships with my friends, get even closer to my friends, and really just surround myself with people that give a shit about the moment we're in that are giving back to the best of their abilities and that are also willing to just look for the beauty in the darkness. This is unprecedented, as we've said, and it's up to each of us to deliver the best versions of ourselves right now for the betterment of society. This is not an excuse to just shrivel. This is an invitation to rise. So that's what I'd like to leave our listeners with today. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. You've been a delightful guest. I know you've got some other things cooking. So when, when they've cooked, we'll have you back again. Thank you so I'm, much. Martin, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it and look forward to seeing more interviews and yes, more to come. Absolutely. All right. À la prochaine. Ciao. <laughs>